Okay, cool. Um, man, guys, thanks for coming out and braving the weather that's out there. Um, morning, morning, morning. <laughs> that's what uh, we're starting to get them. They're really comfortable. He started wearing like uh, some like old gnarly tennis shoes recently. I was like, where are the other ones? So he wears them on Sundays now, but around the office, he's like slumming like he just got out of his garden or something like that. I'm like, where did this come from? So it's just kind of funny. It's just started randomly, but um, yeah. Okay. So welcome to audio 103, I guess we'll call it. Um, there'll be some recap uh, that we'll do today from just kind of recapping other sessions. How many of you guys have been, how many haven't been to the other ones yet? Anybody? Okay. That's what I thought. I thought, yeah, a few of you guys. Okay. That's great. So that, that's actually really good. So um, I'll do kind of a quick overview of some of the things we've done before, just kind of continue to pound the fundamentals and get us back to remembering the, the things we, I think are ultimately the, the takeaways that are really helpful in terms of like, oh man, every time we walk up to a desk, it's probably the things we're looking at. Um, like Viva Latino, that's probably the most important thing. I don't know why that's, I just realized I was like, that's really distracting. Um, so uh, yeah, so in light of that, so guys, for those of you who have been here before, who remembers like, what's the most important thing when we say like, we start at the, what's the, we start at the source, start at the source. So we're always going to start at the source when we look at things. Um, and there's, uh, there are a few of those numbers I'll kind of throw out that I think will be helpful in terms of like, um, just remembering like little like taglines, not going to have like alliteration, like EQ stands for, you know, like we're not going to do that kind of thing, but Start at the sources, I think that was a very helpful thing. And, and I'm going to back it up even more. Like the first session we did, um, we'll talk about the sources, like the heart for us, I think is also really important to remember because we hit on that in the audio 101, didn't really hit on 102. Um, but I think in, not just in audio, but in all of our teams, we want to make sure that like we're coming to places where we're healthy. <clears throat> um, clearly I'm not healthy right now, but coming from a place of like spiritual health, that is a good place to come from. Um, to have that be rooted, grounded, um, vitally involved in community, connection group, those things like that, that we're actually a worshiper. Um, that's what's, on our teams anyways, that's what's really important to us is that we're making sure that people are actually engaged in that and that we don't just have guys who are worshiping by proxy that are showing up and like thinking like, oh, by me participating in serving on this team uh, because I was in the service, clearly like I'm getting fed that way. I think that sometimes... Um, that can happen a lot in the church that like, well, man, this guy was in two services a Sunday for 52 weeks last year. So man, he attended more services than anybody else in the church. Clearly his spiritual health has got to be up where like the lead pastor probably, maybe not. So uh, man, be in community, be in vital community like that. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we're at just coming from a good place because um, there's something, uh, there's a uh, group that I'm part of called Sonnet House. And one of the things that talk about, the first thing that Jeff comes at, uh, who's the lead instructor, he talks about, um, there's, a, there's a warning in each piece of gear that says on the back, it says improper ground you may, ca may cause shock hazard on the back, like you're about to plug it, in, plug it in. It's like, well, I think we could take that a step further and go down the aspect of like, if we're not grounded in the wrong things, we've all seen the guy that like freaks out, like literally shock, like, well, okay, buddy, calm down. Like a little bit of that. We want to make sure that we're coming from a place where like, Man, our value, our worth is not in um, is not in the mix, in the lights, in our craft and our skill, but it's actually found in Jesus. And that's um, when we say start at the source. That's kind of like step zero. If we're kind of with the European number system, who starts at zero, we're gonna say step zero is start at the source, and that would be man, I want to make sure that I'm in a good place. And that would affirm what Cornerstone even say this year is look at connection group equipping. A lot of things we're looking at is like making sure you're in a good place before we start leading others and making sure that this is in a grounded place. Um, uh, our teams here work on the pro, uh, principle of mutual submission. So we're not like production versus music or audio versus, you know, like the, the booth versus the stage. It won't be that. We're, we work really hard to try to uh, bridge that chasm and make sure that we don't have a divide in there between what's happening on the stage, what's happening in the production suites. Um, Ultimately, we want that to come from a relationship. So uh, we want to be in a place where like, especially from production side, that we are making sure everything is set before we ever get out onto the stage uh, so that we can, or we don't spend a lot of time on the stage, but before we can get out to greet guys who are coming in, the musicians, we would rather have like, man, let's, let's make sure our stuff's all in a good place 
So we can make sure that when they come in, we're almost like welcoming because odds are we're probably in before the band is um, in a lot of cases and maybe they're after the band is. So um, by developing the relationship and even when we started doing a salt company on Thursday nights and we do it on Wednesday nights with the weekend teams, is just having a kind of a time that we share a meal together on Wednesday night, Thursday, I don't think you do, but um, uh, just that time to like pray, hang, life updates, just kind of like, man, here's what we're doing this weekend and here's what the vision is. Uh, and the goal of that is to like ultimately erode that divide between the two and make sure that we're all coming from the pl- same place. Um, the worship leaders have a hard task. I mean, they're leading a congregation. They're trying to remember 17 things going on in their mind about, you know, Jim's playing this new guitar part he's ever played before. And I'm trying to make sure he's working through that and I'm trying to make sure the drummer's on the right area and make sure that we're all starting together and ending together and uh, trying to lead the congregation. And I'm also, my mix is, like there's a lot of things going on. So they actually have a pretty hard job. So we wanna make sure that whatever we do, we're supporting them uh, as best we can in that. Um, Our goal would be, especially from the audio standpoint, um, we would love the worship leaders to be able to look out and see that who's at front of house is actually in a place like, man, they're engaged with me right now. That doesn't mean like, you know, you're, like thrown out and slain any spirit and like rolling the aisles and stuff. Like, wow, that's different. We're looking at more of the aspect of like, hey, man, that dude's engaged. And I'm, I'm more concerned, like I'd rather have the mix be like 85% and you actually be like getting something out of it than you be at like 90% and just be like, man, I don't remember a thing that happened today, but I think I got a pretty good mix. Like, ah, man, that's kind of a miss. And that, I think that that same reciprocal activity will happen with the worship leaders. And they look out, man, the number of times that even a debrief meeting is like, man, I could, I could see that clearly you were engaged and that helped us on the stage too. So those are just good things that we think of starting from the story, starting from the heart for us, that source where we're at. Um, yeah, I think is, uh, want to make sure, rooted in Christ, make sure that we're in a good place from there starting. So that was kind of stuff from the first thing, but I thought, man, I, I think that's really good to always remember to come back to that um, as we revisit that. Uh, f- starting from the source, part B of that would be, uh, now we're counting, we're past zero, now we're on to counting with one. So we're now in the American number system. Um, we're looking at my position, we're looking at gain structure, we're looking at all that off the front. We want to make sure that um, the instrument, uh, from the aspect of mixing, uh, the instrument we're trying to amplify when it's coming out of a process source like our PA, we're trying to get it to sound as close to the actual instrument as possible. So there's a signal chain in there, right? There's preamps on the console. There is uh, some kind of flavors uh, added in the DI probably, maybe or maybe not. Maybe things are taken away in the DI because it's a cheaper quality one or something. Um, might be some loss in the cables. There's a lot of things that get from uh, dude's guitar to the PA. There's a ton of things in that signal chain. And we try to make sure we have systems in place that preserve what happens here to when it gets to here. Um, So whatever we're doing, if if we come to a place where we approach the mixer and what we hear is radically different from what we heard acoustically, we probably need to stop and understand like, okay, is there something in the signal chain we need to address? And that might be as easy as, uh, as a bad cable, it might be uh, as hard as like, well, the pickup in the guitar actually doesn't do the guitar any justice. So now I'm trying to overcome a hardware limitation. Um, we do things here to make sure that we try to have good pickups on our equipment so we don't have that option or have that issue, but that could be an issue we'd encounter on maybe a church plan or at a different uh, place or something like that. So like, okay, man, I hear your guitar. It sounds really good when you're standing in front of me. I hear it here. It doesn't sound that good. What's going on? So we're always trying to replicate uh, acoustically what we hear. So it might be walk onto the snare drum, listening to what the snare drum sounds like. Does it have a ring? Is that, where is that ring frequency wise? Uh, is it maybe 180 to 200 Hertz, something like that? We can find that out by ringing it out maybe in the PA. Um, but we're, we're trying to figure out, okay, it's got a nice crack. It's really fat and deep. Okay, we wanna be able to replicate that in the PA not make it sound thin and kind of neutered. That Nobody wants to hear a, a thin snare drum, right? So we're always trying to go back to the source and listen to that. Same with like guitar amps. Before you ever grab a knob on the EQ, maybe think about changing the mic position on the guitar amp. We do that a lot with our guitar amps. Like, um, is there a marker in here? Hey, there's a marker. Um, if you got your guitar amp, 
right? So we got that, and there's a speaker, maybe off center, because um, one of our amps is. Uh, it might be that like right here is not the best position for the mic. It might be that you slide out halfway uh, across the diameter. It might be that you actually have a much better tone there. It might be that you'll see a lot of guys put mics kind of down in this quadrant or down in this quadrant or something like that. Listen to different areas, kind of listen. I mean, don't put your head up to the speaker and listen to it, but move the mic around here. What does that do for me? Like, is it, I find that when I move the mic this way, I end up getting a thinner tone. So if I want to darken up the tone on the acoustic, maybe it's kind of, dude's picking up, maybe it's like a Telecaster or something, maybe a little brighter or something like that. It doesn't have a lot of body. I'll move it out this way to try to darken up the tone a little bit. Before I'm ever grabbing the knob on the EQ, I'm actually walking back to the guitar amp because there's a ton of controls. There's knobs all over this thing. You know, maybe there's a mid-side boost, maybe there's a high, probably some gain, maybe some volume, maybe they're different. Um, so work with your guitarist to understand, hey, uh, man, I don't know this amp. I'm hoping you do. Can we work to find something like it? what? Man, what I hear back here at the amp sounds really good, but what I hear through the PA isn't right. Can we maybe make some adjustments to kind of get to a place where like we're we're in two good places, or where it sounds good in your ears, uh, and it sounds good at the PA. Um, so always going back to the source before we're ever uh, grabbing a knob on the desk. So we talk about source, we talk about good gain structure there too, the right gain structure. Um, and we'll see that a little bit later when we talked about that back in 101, kind of making sure it's metering deeply. It's not like just a little bit of, little bit of sampling down here. We actually want a, a healthy amount of sample. We don't want it clipping, that's probably too far. Um, but we want a, a good sampling rate. And part of that's the old adage that, especially in this new digital world we live in, the analog to digital converters, you want a healthy sampling rate so you actually have something to work with. Um, it's like drawing blood. There's a reason they draw so much blood when they're trying to run tests because if you only draw this much, you can't get a whole lot of results that way. So it, it's the same kind of process that way. Um, yeah, I think uh, mixer basics. So as we walk down a channel strip, typically what you see is at the top, you got your, your gain knob right at the top. Uh, who can describe for me what gain would be as opposed to like the fader? difference between the two. Anybody want to give it a shot? Yeah. So for me, it's always been described as <clears throat> like gain is significant change. Mm. Fader is very like more subtle. Minute, like, huh. Thing. So we always love the board at our home church. Yeah. Put the faders up and then we can make my adjustments. Again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's different approaches on that. Actually, what you just ad addressed there was one of the different approaches. There's, there's a set your faders at unity, basically, or at, at, at nominal zero on the mixer, and then adjust the gain to get to a place where it's, uh, uh, where basically you can mix it at unity. And there's, uh, there's actually good, um, there's a lot of wisdom in that, because with most, um, well, yeah, audio is logarithmic, right? So you've got like, zero somewhere up here, and then you've got this diminishing scale down here to like negative, call it 60 or something like that. And maybe it's like plus 10 here. So you'll find that mixing from here, so this is probably like plus five, negative five, and then all of a sudden you're like negative 15 here. So if you're mixing, uh, let's call it negative 15, that's probably, this is probably negative 25, we'll say. Um, logarithmic, if you're mixing in this area in here, you've got a lot more granularity, you can actually do a lot more with the mix when you're living in this area of the fader. So there's a lot of truth about getting your gain knob uh, in a good place there. And if you have proper gain structure, you've got even like dudes hitting the drum at the right volume or the guitar I'm set, like fixing this things, those things upstream to make sure that you've got a good sampling rate coming in, make sure you've got a good gain structure. You should be able to run most of your faders around Unity and have a good gain structure. There's a different uh, approach that says, set all your gain at zero and then drive your faders accordingly. We would say that's probably not a great approach to do things that way. So there's the two schools, again, trying to mix in here and get your gain accordingly, or set your gain and then mix this accordingly. Uh, we would probably lean more towards this way because you actually have more control by having the, by having, uh, living more in this area here where you've got more discernment. So even if you're down here, this is 10 dB, this is 10 dB. So I'd rather live here and have control across those 10 dB than living in this little fraction of an inch down here. That makes sense, everybody? Yeah, 
Like a coarse tuning and a fine tuning? Right. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, this is, ultimately what gain is, is it's the input volume coming in. So like, it's the input signal. So how much signal are you letting in? So imagine like a, uh, a flow, of, like a restrictor and a flow valve. So like at some point you're, you're turning, like on your faucet, you turn the, this is a, not a faucet inside your house probably, this is like the outdoor faucet, right? So your garden hose, so you're, you kind of like turn it down, it's restricting a little. So you got a little, you open it wide open, you get the full signal coming in. So you're clipping here, you get barely got anything here. So we want to be maybe 80%. I don't know, that's, you know, depends on what it is. So everything's going to have a different, um, a different level you have to adjust the gain to. Um, I find that, again, I've been around mixers for 20 plus years, and I, I find that like, I have a pretty good barometer in terms of like, man, if I'm cranking my gain to like 80% on the console, something's probably not right. And I kind of stop and I back it back down so I don't blow something up. And then I'm like, go up to the instrument, I'm like, hey, is there, are you in the right pickup maybe? Or like, just start asking questions like, man, I, I feel like I'm just screaming hot on this thing. Something isn't right. So, oh, there's a pad on the DI. Okay, there it was. Okay, that explains. Just so you kind of, that's that comes with time. You start kind of feeling that. But man, use your, your gut check and your sanity check. So you're like, something doesn't seem right. If it doesn't seem right, it's probably not right. Even if you're pretty uh, new to things, I think you're going you're gonna to find that like, everything here is at 20 on gain. This is at 58. That probably isn't right. Like, you know, just those kind of gut checks. Um, those are helpful. So starting at the source, getting the instrument right, working with the player to make sure that they're delivering, they're exporting the best product into the PA. Um, I think that's, uh, that's helpful. I, I mixed at Salt on Thursday and a few times that just as we rehearsed on Wednesday, that was the same with the guys like, hey man, uh, I think, can you just give me some more verb out of your, like he's got a pedal board from the guitar player. So I'm like, if you can give me some more verb, I don't have to add verb here. I know you have a reverb pedal. So can I just get some more verb as you're doing that part? Um, and then help them think through the part too is here's what I hear because I'm hearing everything come at me. So work with your worship leaders, understand what they're trying to go after in terms of the arrangement. Um, but also uh, we would say the worship leaders, man, be open to your production guys and make sure because they can probably hear more things than you can. So uh, not saying we have the upper hand in that, but we're at a, um, we have an advantage to where we can solo everything, we can hear everything, where the dude maybe playing guitar in his ears has a lot of his guitar and click and maybe doesn't have a lot of everything else. So I can hear different things. I'm like, okay, so the keys are doing this, this is doing this. Man, can you just string your, like, your swell that you're doing in your guitar? Can you extend that a little more and maybe never actually pull all the way out, but just kind of diminish it and keep it kind of going? Because I think it's going to kind of fill in some space that I'm trying to fill right here. So working with your musician that way, again, working with that source before I'm ever grabbing the knob on the desk. Um, yeah, so gain, fader, uh, you've also got uh, EQ, right? So there's three things uh, with EQ, equalization. So most desks will have like a low, a low mid or a high mid and a high. That's kind of what you'll, you'll typically find on most analog desks. Um, most uh, digital desks will have, it's like a, a four, they call a four band parametric EQ, or you might see like, I think on the X32, they call it like a PEQ, so those are parametric EQ. Um, so there's three uh, kind of finite controls with each one of those banks, whether you just have like a low and a high or maybe a low mid high or whatever, you typically have within those um, a frequency sweep. So you have your three knobs, your frequency, your Q, and they might call it gain or level, whatever it is. Um, ultimately what it's looking like is these three things here. So here's just a standard EQ. Uh, parametric, this is like a four band with shelves. Yeah, so this is a four band, got a couple shelves, and then it's got the filters in here too. Um, but you're just looking at your frequency, right? Where along the spectrum. Your level, so is it, this is tucked down four and a half at 425 hertz. Got a four and a half, or, uh, yeah, four and a half dB down. And then at a Q of 0.54. Um, Q is... Uh, man, if you've taken physics or something like that, or I think physics where they teach that, uh, it's, uh, was it width essentially in this case? Is how wide is that? So like um, Q of 1.4 is pretty close to one octave. I think it's like 1.41. And I'm sure there's some math around that that I'm not going to explain right now. But uh, 
essentially one octave is 1.4. If you look back at the old analog consoles, you'll see uh, really wide cues. They couldn't, like, now a digital, man, we can get narrow. I can take this thing up to, like, a cue of, like, 100 or something like that. It's just, like, it's like laser focus. And there's times where that might be helpful. Um, I remember back even a decade ago, I was, like, laser focused on, like, okay, I hear that ring, uh, and I'm going to target it and get it out. Well, I just, I ran out of bands. Like, something isn't right here. I'm not doing this right. So think fundamental frequencies, right? So you've got you got your uh, you got harmonics, right? If you're you've got harmonics, so down here where you start cutting things out here. When you cut this out, you're starting to cut out harmonics that are happening up here as well. So we would say, man, even for most of the nuance in the room, you're going to cut some more things down here more often than you're going to probably cut things up here. A lot of times um, when we talk EQ, we'll talk about uh, two things: boost to cut, meaning like you know, sweep it up and then kind of sweep across so you can hear like the whoosh, like, oh, there's that frequency that's driving me nuts. And then I'll spin it, I'll cut it out that way and I'll show you that in just a sec. Uh, and then we'd also say subtractive first. So additive EQ can be um, really, uh, really tasty. It can be really seductive, uh, especially in, um, uh, in vocals and things like that or even like in snare we do it and just like, it kind of pops out like that top and just kind of it gets you in the teeth. Um, even in vocals, just kind of warm up the top end to kind of get it to cut through. But especially in a live setting, anytime you start adding like what's not there and you start bringing it up, you start increasing your opportunity for feedback. So we want to if we do additive, you're actually taking away your problem frequencies and you're reducing the opportunity for feedback. So we have very few feedback problems because primarily our approach is subtractive EQ. Um, I had feedback problems a couple weeks ago on a, on a Sunday morning, and it caught me very off guard on the first service. Uh, I'd accidentally turned off the EQ on the pastor's mic. So Mark, I think, Mark came out, and all of a sudden it was like, and I was like, what is happening? Like, this has been years. Like, what? I realized that I'd turned off the EQ, and it was, I knew when I did it was during a video. I thought the video channel was selected, and I turned off the EQ. So the passage channel was selected, and I turned off the EQ. So it's just one of those like, ah! But I had to think through, I was like, how did we get here? Thankfully, I remembered back five minutes earlier, but I was so thrown off by the fact that I was like, we don't ever have, fee like, what is happening right now? Because we practice a lot of subtractive EQ and have things set up, but when you're cutting a lot out like we are in, in our pastures, you put all that back in, you pull the volume up, it's all gonna roll free in the room and it's like, holy cow, okay, and now it's, it's there. So uh, as soon as you take that out, it all went away, thankfully. Um, but yeah, we would say like the boost to cut thing, um, I'm gonna take, uh, let's just take this frequency, nope, that one's on, let's take this one because this one's not on, right? So we just say boost to cut. So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna narrow this up and I'm probably just gonna sweep that across. And as I sweep that across, I'm gonna hear something. Maybe it's this 1K right here. I'm gonna probably bring that back down I'm going to start with just a little so I'm not like, don't do something like this because you're just neutering the signal. You're not getting any life out of that. Um, so I'm probably just going to start uh, maybe around like maybe a little less than, maybe half of a half of, a, half of an octave, so like two point, was that probably two, three, two, six, two, eight, somewhere in there. But I'm going to try that. So I found that this was really bright. I'm kind of sweeping it this way. And then I'm going to pull it back out. So that's what we would say is boost to cut, is that you're boosting it to find out where you need to cut it. Um, that's probably a lot, well, I'll, I won't minimize. I would say that's a lot more effective than, uh, you'll see a lot of guys, like the whole band's playing and they'll push the fader up to like 10 and listen for it. Well, the problem is now you're destroying the relationship of that instrument with the rest of the mix. And it's probably not giving you an, adic or an accurate representation of like when you start treating it and pulling frequencies out, you've got the gain or the level in the room so elevated that you're gonna have to pull out more of the frequency than you probably needed to and you actually are never gonna run it that loud. That makes sense? So try to avoid the temptation to slam this thing up here, woo, you know, like get it all the way up and then, and then dial it up and then bring it back down to where you're gonna use it. Because what the frequency needs to be down at this level and the frequency needs to be up at this level are two completely different things. Does that make sense? Um, where do I have that? Uh, yeah. So that would be our things on EQ. So uh, boost to cut, subtractive first. There is a time for additive. I think you can get away with a lot more additive EQ in studio than you can live because in studio you got nothing 
the mics aren't going back into the PA, it's all captured. So there's even things that we'll do today when I do some mixing here in a little bit. Um, we'll have some additive EQ probably on some things just to kind of get it to cut through the mix a little better even on these PA or even on these speakers. Um, but we probably wouldn't do that live necessarily just because uh, it would probably contribute to some issues for us. So um, certain things like a bass guitar, I do spike a lot of like highs and mids. I'll spike those really high and you'll see in one of our channel strips it's it's like plus 12 in some areas. And it's like, how are you getting away with that? Well, it, the pickup on the bass isn't really going to feed back like a vocal mic will. So is there a mic there? Technically, it's a pickup. It's not really a mic. But you can get away with some more of those things. Even on the drums, we can spike like 10 dB on a snare at like 1K or 2.5K or, or something like that. Well, he's in a bubble. <laughs> so like... The only thing that's going to go back through are other drum mics, so there's no like vocal feedback. So there's, there's certain things that we can get away with depending on the venue. Now, could I do those at conference when I have all open mics in the room? Mm, the bass probably. The snare, I probably got to roll back a little bit because I have to understand the dynamics of the room that I'm in. Make sense? Uh, yeah, so again, mixer fundamentals, walking down the channel strip. So we've got our, our gain. Um, we got down our EQ. We got some compressors or dynamics in there. Um, dynamics one, dynamics two. Sometimes you'll see it um, on an analog desk. It probably goes to an outboard uh, insert at this point. So on digital, oftentimes those already are built in there. Yamaha, it's like yeah, they call them dynamics one, dynamics two. Um, I think they're that in Digico too. Um, it depends on the console manufacturer, but uh, typically you've got like your gates, de-essers, compressors, all those things. Uh, and your most common knobs you'll see there, especially like a compressor, which is probably the most common uh, dynamic tool you use, is uh, like the threshold. So like at what point when the signal crosses that threshold, that's when the compressor starts to actually be engaged. Uh, and then once that signal crosses back underneath that threshold is when the compressor starts to release. Um, so you'll see things like attack, release, um, threshold, and then makeup gains, the other thing that's in there. Uh, oftentimes you'll see something like that. I wonder if there's a, a picture of a... Yeah, here, here's a good one. So, uh, yeah, so here's a threshold. This is like the big old now. I was like, when does the signal cross? Uh, makeup gain, <clears throat> excuse me, ouch. Um, uh, attack and release, so at what point after crossing the threshold does a compressor start to engage? And at what point does when the signal crosses below the threshold does it start to release? So you got fast attack, fast release, slow release, mid attack. There's really no like, fast attack is this for it. It's like every knob is different, so like fast, medium, slow. So it's kind of the way. There's some compressors, uh, there's like an 1176 that was developed back in the 70s that actually like fast is this way, <laughs> gotcha! Uh, so it's kind of backwards, and a lot of guys are like, I don't, it doesn't react, well, it's backwards, oh, okay. So those little things, we use a lot of 1176 around here, and that was a, that was a learning opportunity for a lot of us. Uh, ratio is uh, uh, the, how much compression you're essentially getting. So uh, once you cross this threshold, so for every, like if it's a uh, three to one ratio or four to one, uh, for every one, basically for every 4 dB, I'm only allowing one out. For every 2 dB, I'm only allowing one out. So that 2 to 1, 4 to 1, 3 to 1, that's how much compression is happening. Uh, like 100 to 1 is like a brick wall limiter. So like it's like basically squashing it. Like a lot of, uh, a lot of pop radio is really heavily compressed, right? A lot of radio we hear today. Go back to like, listen, like a Michael Jackson or something like that from like the 70s and 80s. And like, dude, there's like 25 dB of like dynamic range on that vinyl, and um, once we got to like having all the tools available to us in the world, we decided to get rid of all the dynamic range in the world. So now it's like 3 dB and everything's just like right here in compressed. So there's a lot of compression nowadays. Uh, I actually like the sound of a compressed vocal uh, in our rooms. So we do compress our vocals pretty heavily, um, but there's times that like compression doesn't make sense. Like when uh, James, uh, our weekend MD, when he's playing like he, he hits a lot harder than Jenna or Davis or something like that. It's just his style of piano playing. Um, so I have to be different with my compressor approach because when he hits that thing, he's hitting it so much more intense, it's going to uh, be nailing this compressor and you're going to hear that. I actually, I don't, I want to feel compression. I want to kind of hear it, but I don't want to like hear like, 
wow, that's obnoxious, like a ducking. You don't want to hear ducking, essentially. That makes sense? So I think when we, when we talk about that, there's musical styles around that. Um, when we start mixing, you'll probably hear some of that. But uh, yeah, so okay, walking down the channel strips, we got to that. Oxes, everybody understand what like an ox or a bus is? We use a lot of oxes in like uh, effects sends. Uh, we might bus out our subs. Uh, that's just a, a way to get audio out of the console a different way. So get it out to an insert or back in or something like that. Uh, it, a lot of times they're called auxes. So you might have like, you know, you got your channel strip and there's like a bunch of knobs in the middle here. They're like aux one, two, three, four. Um, and this one might go out to like vocal effects or something like that. This one might go off to like you know, drum effects. This one might go out to subs, but it's it's a way to take and just get audio to different paths within the desk. Um, uh, man, um, yeah, I'll spend a little bit of time mixing here because I think that'll cover uh, some of the next things I want to talk about, which is like mixing, uh, common mixing mistakes, uh, which would be like missing interesting points of the song. Uh, knowing the songs, we would say like, we would expect our engineers for mixing to know the music as well as the band playing does. And actually maybe better, I don't know. Um, but you be, need to be a student of the music, be a student of music in general. We would say um, it'd be best if you're a musician. doesn't mean you have to play an instrument, but you should be a little musical because uh, the instrument's really the mixer in our case, right? Um, we're playing all the instruments simultaneously uh, without having to do all the hard work of learning the part, right? But uh, we, uh, we do need to learn the song. Um, so you should be able to know. So like, okay, when we get to this part of the song, there's a turnaround, so and the guitar is just slamming right here, so I'm going to bring that up. Otherwise, if you just kind of have like, kind of push your faders up and just kind of set it and forget it, um, you might have, there might be sound coming out. It might not be real musically inspiring. Uh, it might get you from point A to point B, um, but you may have missed a lot of like vital character in the song that really kind of like takes the listener on that journey from here to here. Um, and it kind of divorces the lyric from the music. Like, let, let's create like a homogenous product so that it's, it's just captivating and engaging because um, that's going to contribute to a really great worship experience, which is what that worship leader who's been preparing all week is like, man, I'm trying to lead these people in the church on a journey. I'm trying to take them with me in this place of encountering a real living God. Okay, well, probably just setting the faders up and forgetting them probably isn't going to accomplish that super well, right? Um, we would say... Uh, um, yeah, again, having a, having a good picture of what the instruments sound like acoustically before you ever start processing them is good. Um, I would say being louder doesn't necessarily fix a lot of things. Um, it can make an issue more pronounced. So feel the freedom to turn things down uh, if they're not contributing to something like, well, man, or like at that point, like if you like, I'm turning down the guitar because it isn't real great right now, but now I have no guitar, that's when you probably need to approach a musician and be like, hey, can we like work to me? Like, I'm having a hard time getting you to sit right in this part of the song. How can we try to get to a better, I know nothing about guitar, but I know what the part sounds like on the recording. I know what, it, what I'm going after. Um, I know what a good guitar sounds like because I've heard them. So how can I try to articulate by using um, maybe some terms like it's chunky uh, or it's, it's really bright, it's harsh. Uh, it's kind of wonky. Like some terms that like when I say those things, there's certain visual pictures that you kind of get in your head of like, oh, those aren't good things. Like, oh man, like, oh, it's dolce. It's sweet. Like, oh, okay, th those are good things, right? It's, you kinda, you're kind of using some words to accomplish. Like if I come up to you and say like, oh man, can you get rid of the 3K? He's like, I don't, I have no idea what 3K is. What do, what do you want me to, I, I have a low, a mid, and a high. I don't know where the crossover is between the high and the high or the high and the mid and the low and the mid. So Okay, it's like, man, uh, it's kind of harsh. Can we maybe roll back some of the brightness a little bit? Oh yeah, sure. He's gonna try to do something. Maybe he's got a pedal that says bright. I don't know. He's gonna try to do something like that. That's like, oh, suddenly like, oh yeah, that man, that's, that's great. I encounter that all the time when I'm trying to work with the guitars. I'm like, I actually don't know a lot about how to play. I don't know how to play a guitar. I don't tune a guitar. Probably should learn at some point. But again, I know I'm a musician. I know, even though I don't know how to play their instrument, I can have a conversation about them about like where we need to get to and help them to hear that. Um, cause they want to sound good. We want them to sound good. We all want the same thing. So how can we work together to get there? Uh, yeah. Questions at this point. 
I'm going to do some mixing now to kind of basically like as I would walk up to a console, like walking through, because we haven't done any in our trainings, it's just like actual mixing. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I had one yep. before you start yep. mixing. You mentioned a DI earlier. What's a DI? Uh, great question. So like uh, uh, direct, was it direct injection, I think is what it stands for. But this is like, that's the little box um, that takes your, uh, basically your quarter inch or your instrument cable into XLR. So you'll see them on, okay. yeah, 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 uh, <laughs> totally. No, great question. Um, so DI, uh, man, we've got lots of different kinds of DIs. There's tons out there, different manufacturers. Uh, I was on a, there's a Facebook group I'm part of that was talking yesterday about DIs on basses and acoustic guitars. And we have four of the kinds that we're talking about in the post. And they start getting into some new ones, like one that Stephen Curtis Chapman uses on a guitar. But he's like, man, we're like, I've never heard of it before. It's like a brand. I was like, wow, I thought I knew a lot about DIs and, I've never even heard of this, but there's so many like these like uh, boutique kind of things that are coming out there. Actually, like give a lot of character and kind of fun. Uh, but we have like our acoustic guitars go through an Avalon U5. So on the on the piano riser, the keyboard riser, there's a uh, there's two racks there. The shorter rack has the wireless unit for acoustics, and then directly below it, there's two like looks like studio preamps. They essentially are, um, and they're uh, we run our wireless signal out into a U5 before it gets into our uh, preamp or digital preamp. So we're using a U5 on that. Um, we travel use J48s, like a little blue 48 volt uh, Jensen DI. So Jensen is a term you might hear a lot, Jensen transformers. Uh, it's a higher quality transformer. Um, so the transformer that converts like that high Z to low Z signal for the, for the desk, uh, all that impedance conversion and crazy things that all the science of why audio works the way it does that I have no idea about. But uh, all the things you'll learn about music technology, I'm sure, at some point or something. But uh, yeah, there's just tons of different DIs out there. There's $20 DIs. There's $2,000 DIs. You know, there's some DIs that have tubes in it. We have a, like the Ready that we sometimes use uh, on bass. It's literally, it's, it's got one or two Class A tube preamps inside. So it's just like literally there's a tube inside that thing like, like in guitar amps. So there's just a variety of different ways to get the signal from here to here. There's some add color. Some are just completely transparent. But yeah, great question. Great question. Uh, yeah, so I'll do some mixing. So this is just, uh, this is from uh, Spring Conference, the Salt Company Conference a couple weeks ago. Uh, and I don't know how many of these I'm going to do, uh, but I want to leave some time for questions at the end too. So um, we'll probably take a few stops throughout mixing, kind of give some ideas. So I'll try to explain as I'm doing this is like why I'm doing what I'm doing, what I'm hearing. Uh, I won't do a whole lot of like, we're not starting from flat. It's got a got a starting point. And actually, that's a, that's a good thing to talk about, too. Uh, when I start a mix, I actually have all my faders up. I don't like, okay, kick. Okay, now snare. Now hats. I'm, I'm actually starting with everything in a place because we don't listen to the, uh, the drummer isn't playing kick, snare, hat. He's playing a drum kit. It's a, it's a complete image. Uh, so I will listen, even when I'm tuning my vocals, I'll usually leave the verb in there because I, I know that like certain nuance in the way that they say, if I cut out the verb and the delay, I might not get a true picture of what the final product is. Now, if I have my verb set up correctly, it, it should just kind of lift the signal. But there's some things, and our room gets a little, uh, gets a little thick right around two, 300 hertz. So I will um, try to keep that verb in just to make sure when I'm, when I'm rolling some of that warmth back into the channel that I'm not like adding too much to where it's like whoa, 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 now in the room. So, cause I might find like, Oh, it sounds good. And I add the verb I'm like, Oh, back to back, back to scratch. You know, um, I'll usually take the delay out cause the delay is just kind of a repeat of what's going on. But, uh, yeah. So I would say even more setting, like when you're setting in your mixes, you're setting any kind of mix, start with your faders actually, whether it's all at unity. So like that, so you have a, just a true image of like, Okay, here's everything happening right now, and I'm going to start moving things into place from here and start EQing from here. Um, I think you'll get a lot further faster than starting to bring up like, okay, drums are up. Okay, and I'm going to add. Now, I will do, when I'm mixing, um, I will uh, mute certain groups, and maybe I'll put like the two guitars here. We have two electrics oftentimes, and I'll put those two together and listen like, what's this guy doing? What's this guy doing? Okay, I'll adjust that relationship, and then I'm going to add the keyboard. Okay, I'm going to bring the guitars down a little bit because actually the keyboard's doing the lead line here. So I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm addressing like, here's the rhythm instruments that are busiest during the song. 
I'm listening to what they're doing, the relationship, expanding the relationship to look at how it relates to other things on the stage, and then putting that all back in the mix. That makes sense? So you're kind of like, I'm kind of starting from here, diving in, listening to some things, and then coming back out to the full spectrum. And I find that that's, um, once I started doing that uh, several years ago, I found that my mix has started to feel a lot better because I'm, I'm, I'm evaluating the relationship between instruments instead of trying to build a mix from like, okay, I got a mixing pyramid. So at the base is, at the bottom is the, the bass and the kick drum and go for the snare and the guitar, the vocals are up top. I think what will oftentimes happen, this happens especially in ears, you start building that, that whole, the band gets really great. Now like you've consumed all the dynamic range with all the band and now you have no room left for vocals. <laughs> it's like, well, crap. What do I do now? So oh, I could start with vocals, then I'll add the band. Well, now you got probably like a really vocal heavy mix. And so it's just different, like, hey, let's just start with everything kind of in there. And I know like even Hillsong's Modern Engineers, uh, they've got a path, um, again, one of these blogs, one of the guys talks about the fact that basically start in their in-ears, they start everybody at like negative 10, every instrument. And then whatever your instrument is, is at, I think like plus five. So like a 15 dB uh, difference or delta between everybody else and you. And then they adjust from there. It's like, oh man, I, I could, you could take the toms out, you could pull the acoustic down, start pulling things down from there. And things we tell our vocalists and our musicians a lot is like, especially in your in-ears, hey man, uh, think about what you need less of first before you start asking for more. Because if I start giving you more and more and more, I might consume that finite dynamic range that you have remaining in your ears. But if I actually start taking things out that you like, or just reducing the amount of level you have on certain things, you're gonna create dynamic range. And actually, you might not actually need more of your vocal. You might actually need less of the pads. So it might be like, just to pull the pads down and you're like, oh, yeah, everything's clear now. I actually didn't need 10 dB more of every vocal on the stage. I just needed less of that single channel. So just those things to kind of think about. There's always one way, there's always a different way to skin the cat. Uh, what does that phrase even mean? Uh, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, so let me jump into some mixing here. So this is actually, like I said, from conference. Let me shut the door just in case of people. Uh, so uh, the first thing I want to do is actually, uh, one thing we encounter a lot in our mixes is um, somebody talking while we have some kind of padding or something going on. Uh, so I think it's helpful to actually just listen to this and kind of see what we do with that. Um, we tend to keep the effects in because like you'll hear right now. So this so is gonna be for conference. So some pre-rolls happening. And eventually Daniel is gonna start with a little bit of his, his electric lick for uh, So Guys, I. And Dana's how talking awesome right now. Is this? But I wanna give some presence to it. There's a delay, there's an, a, a verb on so the tonight, guitar. Guys, so if I had a very dry vocal, together, it's gonna feel weird, as brothers right? And sisters so I've got a little bit of verb in there. I don't have Christ. as much verb as I have when we're normally into the song, but I'm leaving a little bit of verb Tonight, in there just to kind of give some presence to, to it, to kind of fill place, the space okay? a little more. It kind of, I want you to kind of it's more immersive than it is just as like you talking God. to me. And, and to, to worship him as you see when we have a conversation, like there's always reverberance tonight, in our conversation. That's never a dry conversation. We only get that more in a studio we turn off the verb, right? Sitting down, maybe that means there's nuance in this room that's reverberating back at us. So kneel, it's natural to hear some sort of verb of what, he, what he's talking. Write in your diary, I don't know. Maybe it means going to the back of the room and just losing yourself and, and allowing the spirit to talk to you. But I want you to feel But I've got the, the guitar. Freedom. It's, it's in there. It's not the like, tonight. We don't want anything that we're it's doing not competing with it. We want to make sure it's not competing. You. We've gathered tonight to have a conversation So maybe I might pull back just a little bit. To give him glory and honor and praise. And so we're just going to, before we get started. I want to hear Dana clearly. Let's offer him a prayer for the night. So he's going to pray. I might bring that guitar back up a little bit. I'm going to bring Dana's mic down. And I've probably, so I'm mixing this all on a trackpad. <laughs> so there's gonna be a, some little bit of like lag in some things. Uh, if I had X number of faders in front of me, it gets a lot more effectively. Uh, coming probably for Audio 104 or next year's trainings, we will have a little surface here. But um, uh, I would probably also have like all the vocals. I would have Dana here and all the other vocals probably here. 
because they can hear the PA, right? By bringing these down, I can get his mic higher and you can hear him better than having all these guys up at the same level. So I usually, in our call to worship cues or something like that, I usually have these guys at like negative 10 and this dude at negative one. So there's like a 10 dB delta between these. I didn't do that here just because I couldn't get them all up in time, but pretend that all these other vocal channels were actually down. So Dana's was high. So now that Dana's done talking and Davis is actually leading the song, I'm bringing Dana's mic down because again, open mics on stage don't contribute to helping us really. So uh, Dalton's not doing much in the song, which is why his fader is far the way down. It's primarily Davis with a little bit of Molly and Carson. So uh, I'm gonna turn on, uh, we're, we're in Soul Eye. Uh, So I'm bringing that verb back up where it was. Bring in some of my delay, my vocal verb, my vocal delay. I like that that space around him. Sounds like he's not in a chamber, but again, I also know what this song sounds like. I've heard a lot of the radio, I've heard on the album, so I'm trying to kind of emulate that, right? A female's tucked right underneath him. It's not with him. It's not all sons and daughters. It's Hillsong. It's it's right here. It's tucked right underneath. So I want him to kind of walk like this way as they sing. So what instruments are happening right now? Piano and the guitar. The guitar is giving you kind of like... You might see people in the room kind of moving like this, like, well, that's because they can feel that guitar is cycling, right? So you want to keep that in there, kind of just keep that, that pulse. I want to create some margin so I can go somewhere with this song, right? I know what's coming. So if the drums come in there just slamming hot, it's like, oh, that's cool, where do I go with those later? So we're gonna create some dynamic room, right? 3 dB on the radio is great. 23 dB in a live environment is great. It's not, uh, I've got some verb on the snare there because I want the sticks to kind of, I don't want to, because there's a lot, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to keep everything in kind of the same reverb range, but it's wide, it's expansive. I knew the SPD was going to hit right there, so I brought it up a little bit. What's happening right here? Daniel hitting the one wrong note he hit the entire weekend is happening right there. So I'm going to start kind of feathering this back a little bit to create again some dynamic room because I know it's about to start building here. Boost to my vocals a little bit here, maybe. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the ocean, if the oceans roar, your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you, I. Drum's gonna start building, so, so let me give us some more like drum spank. The guitar is kind of. Chuck, 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 starting to build. If the rocks cry out inside, then so will I. If the song of all our things is still for shine, then we'll see it again a hundred billion times. He's 
gonna break. <laughs> Really cool acoustic part coming here. God of salvation, you chase down my heart through all of my failures. Right, dry out the verb and the delay right here. Wanna hear you create? Davis is about to start a really cool piano lead line right now, but I want to kind of take the focus away from the acoustic a little bit. Here we go. So I'm kind of trading who's doing what at that point. I'm listening again. What's sonically interesting as the song progresses? What's taking the audience along in the journey with us? Snare's gonna come in a little more right now. A little too much female vocal right there. It's starting kind of, it's, it's competing with Davis. We're starting to build, so I'm going to bring the verb back up a little more. And bring the piano up just a little bit to kind of give the room some pitch. Yeah. So that's one style song, a little more of a mid tempo ballad, but there's a lot of nice things that kind of happen in that song. Um, questions with like what happened there, like, hey, why did you. Could you guys see what I was kind of doing down here a little bit, like the faders moving and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. This way? All these purple? Yeah. These, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So something uh, we don't do live, we have it bust for it, we just don't use it, uh, is parallel compression. So basically what this does is... Uh, it gives you some, when you need some more like oomph out of your drums, you can get it just by riding that fader up. Um, so let me actually. So it's just kind of bringing out the attack, the two frequencies there. kind of brings it a little more into focus. So I'm just kind of riding that spank group in there. Um, holy verb, it's amazing. I love that, that's so good, that's so good. I told Ben, I was like, hey man, just give me as much verb as you can on the thing, he did. Uh, again, working with your musician to get what you're trying to go after out there. Um, yeah, so we don't, uh, there's a lot of guys, yeah, totally, there's a lot of stuff. So there's a couple things we do, we kind of do it on like bass too, um, there's a, second bass channel that you'll see in our mixers, um, this bass mic, uh, well, that's kind of mic and DI, but basically we kind of put a uh, emulated crunchy bass on there. Um, so parallel on drums, right? So brings that extra oomph out. And there's times that maybe we get kind of big or something like that and we want to kind of drive a little bit more bass. So actually listen to the bass channel here too. It's a similar thing. It's not parallel compression as much as it is. a little more dirty it's not the it's not the clean but it just kind of gives a little bit more of the edge right I'm trying to get a little more of the point to the tone so that's what we're using um, 
that's what we're using, just kind of the parallel compression too, is just kind of given, it's a little more impact. So what, it, why we, well it's called parallel compression. Basically you're running a second bus in parallel and you're compressing it pretty heavily. So um, uh, that's the old adage where it comes from is parallel compression. And there's, man, you Google parallel compression and you're gonna find seven days worth of reading uh, for 34 hours a day. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's, there's tons of theories and practices on it. Uh, again, blog I was on this week was just like, somebody was like, hey man, I don't use it. Does it make sense to, should I? And the best response of the blog was like, hey man, that's not for everybody. Like, don't feel like you have to just because of the tool that exists. Like, one guy was like, I keep it in there and I barely use it, but there's times like it gets really thick and I need some more, like, you just need those toms of slammer, I need like a little more punch to the snare. I just bring it up as I need it. It's just kind of like a, oh, I just need some lift. So what we talked about earlier is like, man, I'm having a hard time getting the vocals cut through, like feel the freedom to turn things down. It might be like, man, uh, the mix is big. I love where the mix is at right now, but I don't have a lot of dynamic runs left on my snare. My snare's maybe at the top, my fader or something like that. I'm going to start bringing it. If your snare's at the top of your fader, we're probably, gain structure's probably not in the right spot right now. But uh, we're going to start bringing that, that maybe just kind of lift the drums up and do a little more presence. We'll bring them down later. You know, when it kills into that cool acoustic part, it'd be a good time to like, it's kind of that reset time where it's like, okay, I can bring down the things that are like, I've been driving slamming hard at this point. So yeah, great question. Uh, where am I in terms of something is soloed right now? There it is. It's like, why is everything muted? Uh, cool. So uh, we'll do, so that's a good mid-tempo. Um, the altar is another mid tempo. Let's go to actually. Let's do one that's uh, a little more uh, found in you, which is actually the next song we did. Uh, so Carson actually is leading this one. She's now with City Gals. I'm going to bring down again. Uh, I would probably have a snapshot that would automate these things for me uh, in a modern desk. Um, so I'm going to actually move the delay. I usually only run the delay. This this bus two is our vocal delay. So that buses out to this right here. And typically my practice is I don't want a whole lot of like, when you have five vocals singing together or four or whatever, anytime you have more than one vocal, they're probably not directly in sync. And your delay, to clean up the delay, I try to only put the delay on whoever is leading that song. So like Davis on that song had the delay and Molly did not. So I do that so I can keep the delay cleaner. That makes sense? So I'm gonna move the delay right now over to Carson because she's gonna be leading this song. Uh, I'm going to kind of pull Davis back in. Dalton's not doing a whole lot right now. Dana is not either. Um, and Dana tends to, as you know, do this kind of thing and be off his mic. Well, I have live drums in the room, so I'm actually going to pull his mic down because otherwise I might get a lot of drum bleed through that mic. So I'm, again, I'm trying to manage what open mics are on the stage right now that I actually don't need. And how can I buy myself more headroom in my mix by pulling things kind of lower that don't need to be in there? Make sense? Uh, those are, those are free. Uh, so that's not the right, that's 118. Let's go to found in you. That's not right. 318. I wrote, I wrote the wrong, wrong number I bet. So we transitioned from that mid-tempo to an up-tempo by having Dan Davis do this. So what I just did there is actually, so Planning Center has the tempo of each song. If you pull up like the, uh, in here, I'm just kind of pulling up the uh, little song chart. It tell me the tempo of the song, and it should be right. Um, so I'm gonna change my delay now to 118. Uh, so that way, actually, it's keeping in time with what the song actually is. So this is my tempo um, for this song. So that way it's not like, at a weird kind of delay, yeah. Is there a reason that's called tap on that bar? I mean, I have the button where you tap the tempo, but... Because you tap the tempo. And that's that, that's the, the Tap order. delay, yeah, it's, yeah, there's, I mean, yeah, it's a old adage, just tap delay is like, because literally we're just tapping it in, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we start with it all programmed. There's times I might like, uh, you could run multiple buses. Uh, you could run the one that's like a quarter of a note, one that's one is an eighth note. Uh, you could do different, uh, 
if you had enough buses, you could do that kind of thing. So like maybe there's times in a song where we start with like a like a quarter note delay. So maybe it's like the song is 72. So we actually might be like starting kind of down like this and want that 72. But as the song picks up in speed, we actually want it to be 144, right? Because we actually want it to be like an eighth note. So I actually might program a snapshot that actually goes from 72 to 144, or I might actually just have one that stays at 72 that is eighth note now. So it's actually technically in 144 because it's two beats every one. So um, there's different ways you can get there. But uh, yeah, it's just tap is... So, yeah. Vocal delay is what I call it in here, so it's actually a little more clear. Okay, and I missed that right there. I, what I would have had right there was this because Bennett starts with a... I want to get... That's turning the corner into the rest of the morning, into the rest of the evening. Dirty bass up. A little more gang vocal on this one. So I, I kind of want to hear all vocals, but I don't want to like. Trying to make it actually sound like a room of people singing. So I'm calling that a gang vocal. There's this thing happening right now. That's kind of fun. I don't want it to be here. But I want it to kind of like... Kind of keeping that. It's supporting what the kick's doing right now. Kind of keeping that circle of rhythm going. Sing in your presence. In your presence. The guitar echo. So it's a call and response here, right? So the guitar is responding to what Carson's doing. So I should have them kind of right here until he starts playing the same time she is. I need to kind of give it some more ducky now so it don't kill her vocal. Cool piano part coming up right here. Again, what's driving us? Tom's a spank it. It's off. I had it muted. thing happening right here. So there's a lot of things happening at the end there where there's like, there's the so it's like, okay, I've got that to choose from. I've got Daniel's like and then there's like uh, there's also some kind of piano thing. So it's almost like, again, that's where the actual mixer surface comes in handy because I can't grab all those at the same time on a trackpad. But uh, 
Yeah, I probably would have like allowed there to be a little bit of call and response at the end of that song too in those eight bars as we shut down the song, kind of allowing those pieces to kind of come out. And it just showed, man, there's, there's like a, almost like a choir of instruments happening at that point. It's like, man, people are kind of, it's a party, it's a celebration. And the room feels that. Again, we're taking the, the audience on that journey, right? We're taking the church along that journey. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like mid-tempo. There's an up-tempo one that just kind of, as I think through it, again, there's a lot of things happening in that song that I'm trying to capture um, as we walk through it. Uh, and uh, this logic doesn't allow me to do it, but typically um, you see, so these are VCAs. This kind of matches what we've got in our console too. So drums, bass, keys, two electrics, acoustic vox, and then beyond that we have 12 on our, uh, on our most of our desks, some have eight. Um, vox, there'll also be a band one in there. And that band one I'm just actually using as the, my volume knob right now. So I would probably like, at the end of that song where Carson's like, Wah! and the band kind of takes over as she kind of comes down. What's the most important thing? What's the most important thing happening at that point? It's not Carson's woes. The vocals, even though nobody goes home humming the kick drum, right? We know, well, maybe drummers do. Um, I probably do, let's be honest here. But most people don't go home humming the kick drum. They go home like, what's the song? We want, and, and especially nowadays, you're having, you're having this turn right now in modern worship, I think. We're like, we still want just a killer band. It's a lot of synthy stuff too. But the vocals are actually, I think in the last year, have come up in mixes quite a bit. Um, just as I listen to a lot of mixes around, like vocals are really present. And I think that's a Jesus culture thing. Um, I started to see, and they use tons of compression in their vocals. So it allows them to kind of just slaughter them through the mix. But it's really cool. It sounds good. And again, what's the most important thing we're trying to communicate? It's the lyrics of the song, right? So it's actually makes a lot of sense. So we've started doing that too. Again, I don't want a church mix to where it's like all vocal and no music. That's not cool. We want to bridge that gap where we still want a really foundational support of music underneath there. Again, it's musically inspiring, but we want the vocals clear and present in the room. That might mean like we have to do something with here so they don't like become harsh because these frequencies will always become harsh if they get too loud, start getting, get, uh, get hard in that. But as they have those woes or even like a woe in the middle of a song, not necessarily at the outro, uh, it might be the woes, I actually bring the vocals down a little bit and my band actually up a little bit because the woes probably aren't the most important thing there, right? It's probably something else that's happening at that point. So what is that other thing that you're kind of bringing out? So again, I'm trying to ride that dynamic, again, creating dynamics within the room. Uh, I'm kind of riding that band fader that isn't on here that I'm just using this volume now for. So I can kind of create like, okay, so maybe we're sitting at 94 dBA for the band. And when the vocals aren't there, maybe it's 91. Maybe there's the 3 dB boost in the vocals. Well, as soon as uh, the vocals aren't there anymore, we almost have lost intensity, right? So maybe I drive that band up at the outro to keep us at that 94 sustained just as we finish strong. Again, forte doesn't mean loud. Forte means strong, right? So I want to keep that forte as we come to the end of the song. We've built this intensity across this three and a half minute journey. And the last thing I want to do as we come to the end is to, I want to finish well. I don't want to like and trip across the finish line. And if the vocals are screaming, we're going to trip across the finish line because we've lost the energy the vocal provided. So how do I make up some of that energy? I'm going to boost my, van, my band a little bit at that point. Make sense? Uh, let's do another way. So this is actually, this is a different exercise in, I'm not going to do all of, uh, what is this song called? Uh, it's the, yeah. Good. Um, King of my heart. Um, I think this is an interesting one because this is a use of effects that um, this is a uh, as you fill in a mix um, there's a lot of things beyond the instruments that can fill in a mix. 72. Uh, vocal delay 72 and this song is actually in 6.8 so it's going to have a dot on it. So I just made that, that D means dotted in, this, in the case of this compressor. Um, so I'm actually going to dot the quarter note now. Uh, I don't know if you can do 6-8 in this, can you? Nope. Cool. Uh, so just a dotted quarter uh, at 72. So, uh, so we're in this song, right? So Molly's singing it. trade though. Never gonna let me I'm gonna try that out a little bit. You're never gonna kind of build here through the end of the song. 
You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. So uh, this is one where actually I would take because Molly and Davis are, it's almost kind of a duet there. It's not a duet, but it is. It's different than like where we had them tucked earlier because Molly started leading this. Davis has this kind of handoff right now, but then they're almost like singing with each other through the end, which is a lot more like the all sons and daughters kind of approach. We talk about that um, would be like almost duetty the entire time uh, instead of having like a, a tucked vocal uh, I'm mixing their vocals different in this song because of what's happening in that moment. So I've almost got them kind of paired. Tom's kind of slamming. So I've got that kind of actually underneath them the entire time to where it's like that vocals uh, was probably a little longer than I want right there. I got them using, uh, oops, wrong one, vocal delay. Uh, so I'm gonna probably pull that back a little bit. It's in 72, you are good. This is straight, isn't it? This one's not dotted, this one's straight. This song is dotted, resurrecting, that's right, okay. There it is. Pull that back a little bit. You're gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you are kind of a cool thing again you're you're adding something in there just kind of i think it plays into that again what's that drive right there's something kind of in there you've seen that room kind of doing this i'm going to play to that feeling um i don't know if that's in the original recording i like it a lot but that's just something we do especially on that one that's probably the loudest i ever get a vocal delay is it's like it's just in there and it's like i think as you're singing congregationally delays can be very uh they can take you out of the moment very quickly right it's like why why is there an echo on that chick song you know like but at the same time like Man, that actually, I've kind of darkened it. Like it's, it's really, uh, I've taken a lot of the presence out of it. I've got this thing like high past at 230 and low past at three. So like taking most of the present out of the vocal, it's pretty dark at that point. Uh, you're gonna ask a question. Is that sometimes how like recordings or producers like feel out almost like a choir-ish sound in the background? Uh, is that something? Yeah. Similar, yeah. It's something like that. Like the, uh, what is it? The Hillsong Choir is like three vocals, doubled, doubled again, panned out. It's like, there's some like math of how they did like on Aftermath, there's some album that they did that was like this classic. It's actually just three guys, but it sounds like an entire room or like the audience mic yeah. sometimes gives you a little more control. But uh, it's usually reverb and not the delay side of thing, but you can throw a fast delay on it. Like if I did that as an eighth, you are, you are, you are, it'd be twice it, so it might sound a little quicker. Um, if I have a faster delay, it's less noticeable. If I keep the tail shorter in a faster delay, I can actually run that hotter in the mix probably. And what it's doing is it's probably acting, it's gonna seem like a verb, but not as much. Um, it, Cause it's gonna be tighter, it's gonna decay faster. So I'll do that even like uh, in tenors or something like that, or like a fast song. I'll bring, the, bring that delay up a lot too, keep it pretty dark, but it's in like, it's like 148 or 150. So it, it's so fast that you just don't, like you, you don't hear, it's, it's not building on itself because I kept the tail shorter um, so it doesn't decay, as, or so it decays quicker, it's not, it's not sustaining in there. Um, 
So it's all about like how long I want, like even as I'm always saying that. How, how much do I want in there? Well, that might be, as so I'm gonna maybe pull that back or maybe I add more of that or something like that. So um, just kind of feeling that out. Like it's just a feel thing. Again, that's something I'm adding, kind of like the guitar players adding something like that. But I think it contributes to that room feel. So that's just a use of effects that I think um, we have delay pretty much in all the time. If you if you actually like listen critically to most albums, even on the radio, you will hear delay in 100% of the time. Um, it's really interesting. If you start listening for it, you'll start hearing it all the time. It'll drive you nuts because now you'll never stop hearing it. But uh, but it's actually like, huh, yeah, that actually really contributes to what that vocal is doing. So it's just it's a tool we use in there. But you have to get it right. And again, you have to mute it when they're not taught when they're shepherding to the room. It's like. Welcome to, welcome to, cor- oh <laughs> gosh, you know, so like you got to be Johnny on the spot with that one. So like the same way we duck, like there's two things I always tell our guys like, hey, when we go into a speaking moment or a shepherding moment, you pull that verb back, negative 10, 12, whatever like that, and you turn that delay off. Like there's two things that happen, like, maybe the only two things that I care about, like whatever you do, make sure the vocal's clear and turn those things down because that's that'll immediately destroy anything you just tried to create in the moment before. But it's like, oh, all the secrets are on the table now. You know, it's like, <laughs> gosh. So, um, yeah, one more here, uh, resurrecting. I think this is a 1785, 1785. Because this song is a, it's a fun one, which, uh, again, I'm pulling all these out of Planet Serum. So I'm banking on the fact that my worship leaders have gone through and actually put the right data in there. Um, <laughs> Cause it's helpful for me or my like in the guitar players are pulling their delays on their pedal boards out of that too. Uh, this one I think is dotted. Resurrecting King. Nope. Oh, come to the altar must be dotted. Oh, come to the altar is. Yeah. Okay. So is resurrecting me. <whistles> yeah, this is straight. Okay. Uh, Probably a little much acoustic there. So I talk about not like, or I set it and forget it. It's probably not a, not a good thing. I think it's points like this, like, man, use this opportunity. There's not a whole lot going on. It's kind of diminished right now. Use this time to get yourself into what's going on mentally. Get your heart in. It's like, I might just take a minute here and just kind of worship. Just like, hopefully I've been worshiping, but like, your name your name it's just that time like be engaged in what's going on as much as like so you don't have to be doing this the entire time but man I think this works I'm not going to leave it here the entire time Kind of not that fast, probably in the lot, but I might have rolled up a little bit. That piano is good, but it's kind of competing with the vocal. I'm going to tuck it just a little more. Big stair head coming up. Your name, your name is Little gang vocal there. I can still tell who's leading it, but it feels like a gang vocal. So I can hear a choir singing essentially.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be a cool place for a delay right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pull this down a little bit as we start to build. This is fun too. Don't ever turn the audience mics into the PA, but it's just kind of cool on a post. You can hear like the crowd really singing well. Quick reset, probably, so I can get back there again. And then Dana completely gets thrown off by the room here. Thankfully, Davis sung through it. Tom's just slamming right now. Dana's just yelling stuff, so I might bring his mic down a little bit. And the room is just at this point just shouting, so I don't need as much vocal anymore, because they, they're leading themselves. So now I can let the band just kind of... Carson's a little off. She's off mic though. <laughs> that guitar part right there is kind of fun. Kind of, again, almost as loud as the drums are. kind of trading out the guitar for the piano on just that last four bars there. But I usually like, uh, so at the end there, I didn't know where the vocals were going to go. I didn't know how we we're going to shut down the song. So I'm going to let my vocalist tell me where we're going. So I'm going to bring them back up, even though I kind of had them down. So the band's just slamming the crowd's just singing out. So I'm going to bring them back up and it might be like, sing that again. Like, so that way 
the audience now knows like, cause I think the worst thing that happens and you see this sometimes like we've got the vocals, the vocals aren't loud enough. People don't know when to start a phrase, right? And you're in the audience. You want to be engaged in that. We want to help them. Again, we're trying to carry them along. We're trying to provide assistance for them. We're leading them in how to worship, right? So we want to provide confident leadership for them. So hopefully your worship leader knows when she or he is about to start the next phrase. The audience might not though. So I'm going to bring that vocal up. So it's like, Oh, and they sing instead of being like, That's my head. you know, you, we've all been there, right? It's like, oh, I didn't know when we were starting, you know, it's, so give them that confidence of like, I, okay, now I know. So I might boost the, boost the vocals just into that turn or coming out of a huge turnaround or something like that. And then I'll bring it back down, maybe 2dB, 3dB, just kind of like let it sit back in. But it's giving that confidence, again, as much as I bring a guitar during a certain part, what happens right now, the vocals guiding the audience, that's a pretty big thing right now. So... Um, I think those are good examples of just different types of uh, how I would approach a mix. Um, yeah, questions? Was that helpful? Kind of listening through. We haven't done a lot of listening through some things, and hopefully, like I said, if we had an actual mixer thing, it'd be a little quicker. But um, yeah. Um, sometimes, like our worship leaders will change the musicality of the song. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that. So, um, I guess how do you how do you anticipate how do you lead through that? If yeah. That makes any sense. Yeah, I think um, you say like live or like just a, a new arrangement of something. New arrangement. Yeah, I think it's just being like I usually try to get with them if it's a new arrangement. Like, hey, can you walk me through how you're starting the song, how you're ending the song? Again, making sure that I understand clearly their intent of what is supposed to be happening. Oh, okay, so primarily this is just piano and acoustic, even though there's a, eight players on the stage. Okay, so the biggest thing you really want to have, your, your intent is for this to feel more diminished, a little more acoustic. Yeah. Okay, that informs how I'm going to mix this thing, because otherwise, like, well, the original, original arrangement was this. So I think just having a, uh, a clarification of intent, having that conversation, that relationship with your worship leader. Again, going back to the source, that relationship, right? So like, okay, hey, so what are you trying to get after this point? So that way I can make sure that what I'm putting out, what I'm producing out, reflects what your musical intent was in this. Yeah. yeah. This is never really like a super dramatic change from what the original song right, is. Right, right. But like recognizing what the nuances in the new version. Totally. Yeah, have it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Others? Okay. Hey, 1002. Uh, which means that you guys should be in your next session already. Uh, yeah, uh, guys, let me pray for us like that, and then I'm going to send you on. God, thanks for uh, raising up labors. Thanks for Salt Network, what you're doing there. God, we stand in awe of so many times of what you are doing. Um, so God, let us never lose that fresh taste that you've whet our appetite with. God, continue to raise it up, do more, uh, even with these leaders in this room, God, uh, looking to learn more about these things. God, we know we need production people at these sites. Uh, we need people on church plants. God, would you... Um, would you raise up people to send them out? And would you backfill here? Because we need it desperately, Lord. We love you. Thanks for this day. Amen.